Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your unhuman break. We are resuming Dark as a Door to a Dream with uh, this next uh, section, which is a conversation between uh, Jaina Brown, whose lecture you just heard, and um, Naima Ramos Chapman, who I'll introduce right before we get into it. And uh, the title of the um, conversation is Playing with Magic, which I think is appropriate given the union or intermeshment of science and magic that we just heard Jane Brown lecture on in her proposal for Afro-speculative method. I'll be an unmoderator for in unhuman space today, uh, so I'm going to hand things over to um, uh, to Jaina in a second um, after I introduce uh, Naima. Uh, but uh, both have agreed to uh, uh, take some questions, which I'll moderate after their conversation. So as you've been storing up your, uh, uh, your questions, I'll uh, just look to me after this, um, and we'll take a question or two, uh, or three, or we'll see how many. Uh, Naima Ramos Chapman is a, um, was previously in a former life, according to her bio, uh, a journalist, um, although she's still a storyteller and is still using her um, research, project, research practice uh, to imagine interventions, to imagine and intervene at the intersection of race, gender, popular culture. Uh, I came to uh, know her work, <laughs> many people have known, known, known her work in, in the United States and, and beyond through the um, kind of mind-boggling show Random Acts of Flyness uh, on HBO, but I actually first saw her work on um, Jana Brown's couch. <laughs> we were watching a screener of And Nothing Happened, uh, and I was like, we have to get <laughs> this artist into our conversation. Uh, this, uh, her film, And Nothing Happened, was an unsettling but forceful feminist, black feminist vision of the aftermath of sexual violence. And it screened widely, uh, including at the 2016 Slam Dance uh, Festival, the LA Film Festival, and Cinema Africa in Stockholm. So it's sort of been circulating on this side of the pond, as they say. And it won the Best Director Award at the Tacoma Film Festival. This work and some others, I'm told, can be viewed on Vimeo. So we're thinking about how and where images, artistic images, circulate. and. Um, they will say more, but I'll just give you a, a quick preview that we will get a chance to watch her uh, current work in post-production now, or uh, um, a PU PU, which we'll be viewing um, later in the, um, in the program. Uh, Naima is working on her first feature with a wonderful uh, suggestive title, Sad Songs and Languages I Don't Understand. So uh, let me, uh, with that, uh, hand things over to uh, Jana Brown. Am I going to literally hand over the mic to you? Is that, do you have a mic there? Are you, I'm not going to literally hand no, over the mic. Working. Okay, so please welcome Jana Brown and Naima ramos Chapman. So I'm so glad that you could come um, to Amsterdam. Very exciting, and I was so excited when I saw your films. Well, first of all, Last year, I saw this amazing show called Random Acts of Blindness, um, which, like Tavia said, was mind-blowing. Um, I couldn't believe that HBO picked it up. I was still wondering how that happened. Um, and, um, and then I was lucky enough to have, you know how it goes, a friend of a friend introduce me. And um, there's so much that I, you know, to, to say about that show and about how you work collectively in making the show, which is really interesting to me, so maybe we could get to that. But I wanted to start um, because we were talking a little bit about, um, well, I'm thinking about reality and unreality and um, surreality. Uh, Tavia and I are working on um, thinking about uh, Afro-surreality quite a bit. Uh, we're working on a project together. so. Um, but we were talking specifically about your work being, um, you have identified it with the for as a form of magical realism. And I wondered if you could say a little bit more about what this form means to you and how it works for you. Um, yeah, I mean, 
I started making films about like four or five years ago, and um, to be perfectly honest, I feel like my work is mostly influenced by literature, and um, uh, there's definitely a connection to Gabriel Marquez and his work and 100 Years of Solitude, and just thinking about the way he writes about memory and how things can sort of, um, it'll be raining when one person tells a story and not in, when another person is, and just sort of, um, these layers on top of layers of, I'm like, for me it's sort of, I'm not so interested in exotifying the space without, but sort of what is already there and accepting that reality. Um, so for me the magical realism is, is not so much about, you know, um, concocting dreams and projecting that out, but like seeing what is there, but also this essence of feeling that is hard to render um, and trying to figure out like very, um, I wouldn't, practical is not the word, but like ways that they do exist or the way I see them. And I think, you know, um, in my first film and nothing happened, there was, at least it's um, about my experience with trauma and just sort of seeing kind of two worlds and like um, seeing this like past sort of being relived in the present. And for me that, you know, magical realism is sort of the closest, um, sort of like way to explain that in a shorthand of what that so meant sort of me. disruption of time. Yeah, disruption yeah, where the, these things are collapsing in space and time space and time, yeah. are living together, but that is also what trauma is, sort of like your inability to un like take knowledge. Oh, like this is knowledge from the past. Instead it's like, no, it's this living with me in my nervous system um, while I'm, you know, my mom is touching me and I'm, you know, that touch is imbued with multiple meanings. Sure. So it's sort of embracing that multipli multiplicitousness um, in that reality. And reflecting it more, what's the word, more poignantly, more resonating more with, yeah. with what it's actually, what's actually happening. Um, yeah, well, but, yeah go oh, ahead. and I was like, there's a, there are other filmmakers that sort of, I think, are in this, this vein of family, like, you know, um, like La Cienega by Lucretia Martel, or you know, thinking of, of just, I don't know, like real life is pretty magical, and kind of just living in that. Although I, I am also interested in surrealism and like Salvador Dali, who I'm really fascinated with. Um, um, so the dreams do also live there. And I don't, yeah, and I'm not so attached to genres or labels either, but yeah. But working from a different, working from a three places rather than a, a different consciousness. Yeah, and just acknowledging yeah, and accepting that dimension. Yeah. 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 Well, now we're sort of talking about um, your work deals a lot, deals with um, trauma and surviving sexual abuse. The film that we see later today, and we'll see clips of, right? I'm going to watch some clips of um, And Nothing Happened, your first piece. Um, and I have loads of questions, so maybe um, we maybe should see the clip first. Yeah, watch the clip first, which you were generous enough to let me watch after we uh, uh, met, and um, then I knew that you had to come. But um, So do you want to say some things before we show the clip? Of no, I don't like to talk about the work before we usually show it. until, yeah. Okay, good. All right. So we'll show some clips from uh, Naima's film, And Nothing Happened. salir afuera hoy Naima
Thank you for forwarding us your new mailing address. I will work on processing your clothing reimbursement check. I have a few questions for you to see if there are other ways we can further assist you. Did you relocate to New York City as a result of the crime? We may be able to reimburse you for moving costs. Do you have any outstanding medical bills? We can reimburse you. If you had paid for any counseling services, we can reimburse you. Or, if you are interested in accessing such services now, we can pay the provider directly. Please let me know if this is something you are interested in, and I am happy to further explain. No, and don't touch me, Naima. Especially when you don't close. Don't. Don't do that. Don't do that. So I passed out on the couch and I... They thought it would be hilarious to draw a mustache on my face. Um, and put it on Facebook. So I got a lot of laughs. Oh yeah, it's on. Um, yeah, so that's a clip from the film, and um, most of what you're kind of missing, just to contextualize it, is like um, the beginning is sort of. Um, I mean, you can watch it on Vimeo, but the beginning is sort of, um, you know, she she wakes up and there's a black hole, and um, she sort of dismisses it and. Um, goes about her business trying to escape her apartment, essentially, and, um, you know, she's, she masturbates to um, rape porn, and then you're kind of slowly understanding what that's about, and, um, yeah, and then the ending is sort of getting into more of the conversation around what actually happened. Yeah, and, and yeah, um, and for me, you know, Sort of the inspiration for that film was, I mean, it was definitely based on experience, but um, it, 
was also sort of like a call to action just because I was, I remember going to a lot of cinema in the States and just noticing that, um, you know, I'd be triggered and I'd have to walk out if there were sort of these scenes depicting rape and um, kind of centering the action around assaulting a woman's body and treating it and exotifying it as something that is like, you know, um, just being acted upon as a vessel. And I found that sort of um, not, in my experience, what was the most brutal part of the act of rape. For me, it was sort of like how it would linger um, far after uh, those moments. And you know, this is my experience, and I'm not saying like anybody's response, everybody's response is valid. Um, but for me, it just felt like, you know, there, in mass media, there's an oversaturation of the imaging of um, brutalizing women's bodies, and I didn't quite understand like to what end and why, and how can I um, make people feel uncomfortable and really, you know, in a sensorial way without, um, with the challenge of not showing the rape again. So yeah. You, I mean, you, you, your work is so raw and so intimate. I mean, you let us in, you know, to your and, and to a proximity to your body, you know. Um, and I'm wondering for you, I'm thinking, you know, is that, where's the, is it different than the kind of ex exposure or nakedness or vulnerability that at least in my experience, you know, I have felt when I have been sexually um, abused, right? So what am I asking? Is there agency in c kind of claiming that the t that you're setting the terms for that kind of intimacy and exposure and vulnerability. Well, Does yeah, that make sense? I think at the time, at the time when I made it, it was sort of like catharsis and um, all that. Although now I've definitely realized you cannot process your feelings through art, at least me personally. Um, but I think it did allow an exploration in terms of, yeah. Um, you understand that, I think a lot of survivors understand there's no return to normalcy, and a lot of times you walk around understanding how fragile life is, and that's with any trauma, it's not just sexual assault, but, um, and walking around with that fragility, I think, does allow you to see a few, like multiple, multiple dimensions of, of feeling and what is actually happening and the disappointment of now, and like having to live with that and live with your thoughts, um, or live with depression, or live with suicidal ideation, and all these things come up. Um, and what does that look like? Um, yeah, and so for me, it was also a way to explore like you know victimhood ontology and just thinking about um, what's really harmful in terms of these labels of like, um, or it doesn't have to be harmful, but you know, I noticed in my experience there was a pressure to be the perfect victim instead of like a person, a person who exists beyond a moment in time, and you know what. Like, when I was going through the process, I remember even being told, like, don't release this film because you have a case coming up and it might make you look bad. Or like, you know, and just even thinking about the Kavanaugh trial um, in the US and um, like having a certain level of performativity in order for your trauma to be um, recognized and legible. Um, that sort of, to me, was, was very, um, troubling to me and even thinking about the way, you know, generations of women I know in my community would talk about sexual assault with a sort of monotone, um, monotone air as if it was like, you know, I, I went to go pick up some milk at the grocery store because that's how common and prevalent it is. And so for me, it's sort of like the, the mundanity of rape is what is so brutal. And so that's what I was trying to convey in the film was that it's not always about like, um, you know, crying and sitting there telling your story in front of an audience and this sort of, you know, even where we are now in the, um, where there's someone here and you are receiving and you're not participating as an audience. Um, and how do you disrupt that? How do you disrupt that idea of being grounded in the, in the woundedness, right? And placing your identity in the trauma? Yeah, right? Is that sort of what you're thinking, talking about when you're talking about victimhood ontology? Could you explain that a bit more? Yeah, I mean, it, for me, it was just sort of allowing the full spectrum of humanity with any of these labels that, like, I have a problem with categorization and labeling in general, because 
And I think we all do, which is why we come up with some new terms all the time to express our identity. And I think that's beautiful in and of itself. And it's very freeing because we understand once you solidify something, it becomes the box that you were trying to escape. So I think, for, at least in talking about sexual trauma and sexualized violence, um, that to me was important, is like how do you break apart um, these ideas, these very solid, heavy ideas that we have about what it means to be a predator, what it means to be a survivor, what it means um, to be an individual versus, like even that, like even this idea that there's an easy monster to call out and say, which is why I did not want to show and center um, the abuser. Like there's a person in that room and that you never see his face because it's not that important, you know? And you don't know whether or not it's someone in her family or someone like R. Kelly, you know? And, and to me, it's sort of, that is um, a straw man, like the R. Kelly and Michael Jacksons of the world because it's sort of, it's, they're too easy to kind of like, you know, we deify them and then we tear them down. But sexual abuse, you know, is, is a communal issue. It's like in your backyard at your cookout as well, so. Like you said, in, in the mundane. It's in the mundane, but you and I were talking a, a bit more, we were talking about um, the concept or the term or the language of healing, right? The idea of, of, of healing. Um, and it comes up in relationship to the next, to the next clip, I, the clips hopefully we'll get to see, but, um, you want to say a little bit more about your relationship to the concept of healing or? What are we talking about? You gotta remind me. <laughs> oh, what we were saying was what we were saying. Um, that the, the way that the language gets, the way that the term gets used, oh, right. right, is that it gets invested in this idea that you're going to become some, like you said, you're going to be Yeah, there's be something to fix. There's something to fix. There's something to fix. And I, I think I loved what, about yesterday's, like, you know, this idea of the broken machine and repair and this idea of, like, self-care. Um, I, I always have, like, not a conflict, but um, a questioning or a curiosity about that because there is sort of this idea that there's something that needs to be fixed yeah. versus, like, you're just open to understanding mm -hmm. that um, there are wounds and, like, there is a healing, but I don't, healing sometimes implies like an odyssey or a journey where there's like some nirvana over here and right. I don't know, like I haven't gotten there and I think that's okay and fine and how do we accept that um, versus like, you know, I think it's. But it's a practice. It's a practice. Right. It's rather ongoing. Than, rather than some restoration of some form. Um, we, uh, and then who, we were talking yesterday, I think it was from a question from the floor for some of the speakers about um, it being also a very gendered construct, this idea of care and nurture and, and, and you know, and, and so how to sort of think about those things outside of that idea of sort of um, the nurturing mother construct. In other words, you know, and part of that is, you know, what does it mean for women to be angry and destructive? as a response, right? You were talking a little bit about yeah, the expectations that were gonna be, you know, the healing force. Right, for yourself or others. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, um, there is some, also I'm like, I'm kind of wary of the pendulum swing of like, you are either caring a lot or you're completely destructive. And, you know, I think both of those are valid, but there's also like, I'm also resisting duality or accepting duality because that's still, binary and so how do you move beyond that and just say like you know today I might be acting out tomorrow I might be caring and then there's some stuff in between and like the in-between to me is more um, not more interesting but it's like as important um, and so it's not to being allowed an interiority being allowed to have a complexity of feelings. exactly being complex in that and you know I think the the character created you know um, part of it is me, but it's also a reflection of the way, um, like I've seen women in my family respond to sexual trauma, and um, it looks all sorts of ways. And I, for me, it's like so important for us to just accept that, um, and with as little judgment as possible. Um, yeah. So 
So, um, how are we doing for time? Yeah, okay, okay. Um, so, I'm, this sort of segues into um, the thinking about uh, gendered forms of care. And there's two, two ways to take this, but I kind of like to go into this piece that you just recently made, Nowhere Nobody, yeah? And um, it's a music video you made with the musician Earl Sh Sweatshirt, yes? And um, so for me, there's really kind of a language of care going on in this video, and maybe we can talk about that as well as reconceptualizing not just what women is about, but um, masculinity, right? And, and some of those conversations that you have in your work around um, the responsibility for moving to something alternative to a toxic kind of masculinity, right? Which is, so can we show that? Nobody, nowhere? Okay. This is actually from Random Acts of Flyness. You can watch it on YouTube, the full one, and it looks a little bit better than what you see here. It's just a little dark, that's all. And you can do it with captions as well, so yes. you can get some of the things. But that wasn't the Earl sweatshirt. No, that's not Nowhere Nobody. Video. Um, that is called Nunkalan, and it's a clip from the show Random Acts of Flyness. Um, funny thing is I absolutely hate musicals, but <laughs> I think I did okay. Um, 
But yeah, this was sort of inspired by um, this conversation I was having with uh, my partner who, hmm, how do I say this? I'm gonna rewind. Okay, so, <laughs> so essentially it was just sort of, um, what I felt was sort of like this distancing from the legacy left behind in terms of patriarchy and you know, um, I feel like we all know what a fuck boy is or there's this sort of like, you know, this Peter Panning that's ha like was happening or is happening in my community where I felt like, you know, even when we're, I'm in these conversations about like sexualized violence and trauma and abuse, um, that guys, you know, um, were quiet and I think sometimes for good reason and other times because um, the fear of being called sexist is so much more important than actually engaging in the conversation or you know um, even thinking about reclaiming masculinity and instead of you know just being ah oh, it's toxic like you know and thinking about Peter Pan as a metaphor of you know well I don't want to grow up but part of growing up being um, a like how do you take responsibility and also expand the idea of what masculinity could look like versus just you know throwing your hands up and being like well, I'm not toxic, so I'm gonna like, you know, and then kind of leaving the growing up, and this is, you know, hyper gendered as well, and I definitely apologize for that, um, but just talking about my experience as a woman, and so just thinking about feeling that like, especially as a Afro-Latina, and I'm half Puerto Rican, half black, who grew up around Dominicans, I felt like there was a lot of like boyhood stuff in machismo culture where, you know, you don't have to grow up ever. Um, and what does that do um, to the women in those families? And yeah. And the beginning of this section that you directed um, is a wonderful, what, what we didn't see, so we do see it, is this wonderful de conversation or depiction of um, a kind of intimacy between men and that being part of, part of it, right? This. Um, and, and again, that may, that's not something we're imagining that doesn't happen, but we're acknowledging the forms that do happen. There's a lovely, lovely kind of conversation all the way through the series that I, I appreciate about that. Yeah, and it's sort of, you know, asking these questions about intimacy and um, what is the part of being, of toxic masculinity is this inability to like reach out and touch someone without it being, you know, um, vilified or hypersexualized or, you know, just sort of, um, like, what does that do to, like, little boys who, you know, are wrestling or just want to play with each other? And um, even thinking about, you know, using violence as a way to get close. Um, and, you know, I would see it growing up where, like, you know, I, we can't touch each other, but if we fight, that's okay. So let's fight, you know, um, and kind of thinking about that gesturally, you know, I'm a dancer, and, and thinking about how bodies move in space um, in resistance to um, people saying, like, this is what a boy does, and this is what a girl does, and this is, you know, and kind of dictating those rules, and how do you defy them, even if you're saying one thing, but your body wants to do another. And so, um, in the beginning, there's sort of that playing into that, that even though there is machismo culture, like, I had a lot of um, Dominican cousins who would sort of, like, figure out ways to stay close. And it was one of those things, yeah, that was, yeah. I mean, it, it tends to sort of then become a kind of a heterosexual conversation, heteronormative conversation, right? But I think that we, we were also talking about the ways that it, um, you know, queerness doesn't always act as a anathema to some of those forms of toxicity um, what was the last thing? Oh yeah, I wanted to ask you, I think we have a few more minutes, about um, what you're working on now. What's your most current project that you're working on now? Um, I'm working on a few things. I mean, um, the video Nowhere Nobody is sort of somehow related to it because there has a lot of um, imagery about, um, well thinking about tox toxic masculinity, like I'm working on a documentary about my father and, um, he was incarcerated for 15 years, way before I was born, but sort of, you know, thinking about um, 
how that past um, kind of interacts with the present in terms of his inability to come back and kind of debunking this mythology of um, fatherlessness in the black community and really kind of thinking more about how these white supremacist institutions are part of dismantling like family structures and aren't really being held accountable and all these op-eds about you know how absent we are is like not um, it's not the reality that I know um, and that like despite the 15 years and you know his his community organizing um, that he always is very present when he is around um, but not but also not excusing sort of um, the work that women also who aren't having these stories center around them about what that um, absence looks like or what that extra labor in terms of parenting or holding families together, um, what that looks like in a surreal way, in a um, real way, and, and kind of figuring out how to image that where the past is the present and um, kind of imagining together with him and my sister um, how to incorporate that. You, you know, and I know from we were talking that um, your father is like seems like the same generation as mine, uh, father, and um, the, the sort of the era of, the, of black radicalism. And my dad was also kind of a black radical, spent a little time in jail, and um, so I think it's very interesting to to come around to then talking about or looking back on from the inside what that radical politics felt like or looked like as a child, right? Because <laughs> it wasn't necessarily, you know. Yeah, and I mean, I think, and I think even thinking about labels and deconstructing that, like the sort of reverence that we look at, like Black Panthers or the iconography of a certain era and like not human, like not bringing that down to, to reality and understanding like there are Black Panthers who were petty or like, you know, just playing with those ideas and, you know, or thinking about my own father and, and his work as a community organizer and you know he wrote speech he like worked alongside Angela Davis and you know my mom used to bodyguard for her and like that these people are in an era that is sort of deified as well and like but kind of showing you know what those ch children of that era look like and what they're doing and what activism looks like for them um, I'm sort of interested in and um, also like what our dreams look like, you know, because they were doing the work. Um, so did, did you see the documentary, Whose Streets? Yes, I yeah. love Saba, yeah. Yeah. she's amazing. Yeah, did, did people see it here, maybe? Yes, no. Whose, Whose Streets? streets? No. No. Well, okay. Well, this is a fantastic documentary. T Tavia, you want to? You have some? No, no. Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just going to suggest that I don't think people have seen it, so maybe that would be a good way to bring in questions. A question or two? If you yeah. Know. After good. after you describe. No, no, no. It. That's yeah. fine. I mean, I was just thinking about your your relationship to the process of making films and. Yeah. And I mean, um, kind of like nothing happened. I kind of. You know, I like to choose, like work with non-actors sourced from actual documents, like the letter you were hearing um, is an actual letter I got. And so it's sort of this hybrid of documentary and, and narrative. And so um, Whose Streets is a, is a good example of like a really amazing documentary, but it's not quite um, what I'm necessarily interested in, but I am interested in kind of documentary realism and bringing that in um, with magical realism. and kind of having liberties to talk about creating like a biography of feelings um, and mythology, but making it, you know, feel very real, as real as possible. So should we move to some questions? Yeah, we have, um, we're, at, we're at, first of all, thank you both for this rich and rich dialogue and for sharing two clips of your film, uh, Naima. Um, we just turn so facing the audience, always face the audience, right? Uh, and um, we're, uh, we're exactly at time, and, and, and you both had said you wanted, so we're not, we're not late or anything, we started 15 minutes late. So um, if there are, if, if there's a, a question, 
in the audience. I'm, I'm kind of giving you the opportunity. You don't have to ask a question. I come from the like Quaker tradition where like not asking a question is also a way of asking a question. So if you're sitting there with your thoughts, that's great too. But I think both Naima and Jaina would be, would be happy um, if someone has a response to either film. Okay, I see one in the back. Um, someone will come get a, uh, a mic. Please address your questions to Hello? Jane Aaron. Hey, thank you to you both. It's a wonderful conversation to hear. It's a small question, actually, but I'm just curious how you both would relate to it. I couldn't help but think, as you were talking earlier at the beginning, about restorative justice. And I'm just curious about, I mean, there's very specific examples of how that happens within communities, but maybe it's just related to something I've been doing of how we can maybe think that as a form of repair, but not trying to get to the point of ultimate healing or something, but thinking about how to share the pain, perhaps? Yeah. Thank you. Um, just to ask the question, just to make sure I understand, in terms of sharing pain as part of the process of healing in restorative justice, um, and how do I feel about that? Or like, do you see that as a potential methodology for dealing with some of the things that you're talking about in your work? Um, yes, but it's not, it's, um, I'm kind of careful to not, uh, like I'm an artist and not an activist. And so, um, although those two, two things are not exclusive, I think there are times when I um, am, but, Restorative justice, I mean, there's definitely a lot about restorative justice and emergent strategy that I think I'm sort of always thinking about in terms of making films. Um, and in terms of sharing as healing, I'm in a funny place right now. <laughs> in terms of um, wondering how um, to conflate sharing with healing, just, just because, um, like I have shared this film a lot, for instance, and I don't necessarily feel healed because I think healed has like a finality to it. Um, but I do feel like there is um, a value in, in sort of encouraging other people to add their voice to the record of archiving these experiences. And um, that's valuable whether or not something is healed or not. Um, and I don't mean to be vague at all. Um, that's just like my experience right now. But I do think, you know, I, I am a, um, a fan of transformative justice and, and also just thinking about um, ways outside of, you know, the criminal justice system and thinking about, you know, culpability as a communal um, responsibility just because in my experience, like, um, to reduce uh, as like predator and prey or survivor and perpetrator. Um, and even thinking about like Weinstein and how many other people are allowed for certain interactions to happen or knew like, if I seat you here at this dinner, you know, I can say, you know, don't go anywhere in private with him, but I'm still part of this like daily mechanization of patriarchy. Like we need to all kind of confront that and think about the ways that society has made it, you know, it's rape culture. And there's cultural things that are all weaved through. So not to, yeah, so I hope that answers some of the question. I mean, I think the interesting things go on in the name, in, in around the concept of care um, and self-care and, uh, that what I like of so, some of the language of restorative justice is that it's collective and communal rather than you know this kind of um, model of self-care as in self-cultivation. You go to the spa, you go to your yoga class, you get, you know, right? That kind of self-consumption and self-individualist uh, idea. So, um, I think it's really important to claim that kind of concept of, of care. I know I just talked about how, like, you know, we're not supposed to be human anymore, but I think actually <laughs> there's a way to care that doesn't get caught up in that liberal humanism, right? Yeah. Can I ask a quick follow-up on that, uh, Jaina? Because 
you did talk at the end about um, recovery, right? And, uh, and, and, and your talk earlier, uh, and, and yes, you, yeah, you mentioned not recovery, but re-enlivened. You talked about re-enlivenment. I wonder if there's any um, any connection between this idea of re-enlivenment and um, restorative, reparative justice. Is there is there a kind of justice at the end of eating everything, for instance? Well, that, I mean, I'm not sure about, at the end of that film, I'm not sure what to do with it all the time, but because it seems too obvious to be like, and we're reborn, you know. Um, but I think the difference for me is that, you know, if some, the trauma, or not even to use that word, but like the, the devastation, the destruction, the violence, you know, that it's irrevocable in a certain way, right? We don't go back to, we don't recover an, an old, a normative kind of form, right? Conguiem talks about this, this anyway, about um, that it's not about, you know, that he, that, that you are actually, yeah, so re-enlivened is a term that I'm sort of, you know, there's different ways to sort of think about what it means to be, actually be alive, right? Because I'm not, I mean, I'm not talking, I'm not a fan of the kind of the idea of we're socially dead and that's it. You know what I mean? There are ways that we can claim life in different ways, which is what I'm trying to get at. Thank you. I think we're all interested in that question. Um, speaking of questions, um, maybe have time for one more. Um, we will also continue to pursue these questions threaded throughout the day. Um, so looking, oh, a bunch of questions. Wow, okay. Can we take? three and then respond to the three quickly? Okay, so we'll take the, the three hands that were up. Try to formulate the question. It's in the back there and they'll come to the front and then there was one over here, I think I see. Let's we'll take the three questions and, well, who has the mic? Uh, you got the mic. Yeah, uh, thank you first of all for the wonderful lecture and for sharing the art and the struggle which you go through. Um, my question would be, because there were a lot of topics that you talked about, about toxic masculinity, you talked about um, the, you know, the struggle of being black in the community, you talked about like so many things. And I think, for example, like when you talk about toxic masculinity, it's important that also a male joins the conversation um, and talk about the issue exactly like, uh, for example, when we're talking about racism, it's interesting to see also the opposite side, how white people talk about this. So I want to ask you, is it possible for a white person to um, insert what you're talking about in their art? And is it possible without culturally appropriating, without offending? And is it possible at all for me, for example, talk about the struggle because obviously I'm white and I will never be in the same position as you. I can try to understand, but I will never feel. So how is it possible to handle this? Thank you for that question. We're gonna hold the answers until we have the other two, and then we're gonna end this round. Um, that's how we're rolling, right? Um, thank you for the question. There was a second question in the front, and then the third, and that's it for now. Um, thank you both so much for this wonderful talk. Uh, I was wondering about the video you made with, together with Earl Sweatshirt that we didn't get to see, unfortunately. Mm, I guess my question is, like, what questions does it raise in the, in the video? Or what problems? And also, like, whose initiative was it to, to do this collaboration, if, if it was his initiative or yours, and how yeah, if you could say a word or two how you, how you approached it, both of you. Okay, we have a question about the film we didn't see and, uh, and about collaboration. Uh, and then one final question. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your experience and trauma with us. My question is, is about the process of uh, making your experience uh, public. And, and I would like to relate to something Jana said, said uh, earlier about, she said, embracing the dislocation and the alienation. And, um, and, and I feel like you, you don't overcome trauma. You, 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 you maybe find a place or not find a place, but 
Um, so, so how was that for you to make that public? You said you hope to create some household space for others through that process. Um, so that's not a very precise question, but this is. Thank you for that question. Thank you all three. Um, we're going to give the floor back to uh, Jaina and Naima to address some or all of that. I understand it won't be everything that you might want to hear from them, but if whatever from those questions you feel ready to <laughs> respond to. Go ahead. Um, cool. I'm a little confused about your question. I just want to understand it. Um, Do you understand it? The experience, can you just say it one more time or like yeah. try saying it shorter? About your decision to make that experience uh, public, public. Okay. and embrace things that alienation of you earlier spoke about. Yeah. Okay, cool. Choosing a form that is, uh, you know, choosing a form that is not a documentary, that is not abstraction, that is magic. You know, right. embracing it has a fully. Narrative. Is, is, I, yeah. yeah. Ah, yeah. Yes. Oh, right, because I could have just like done a documentary style of sharing. Um, that's true. And um, hmm. why did I do it? Well, I guess, oh, well, because, <laughs> you know, I used to be a journalist for a while. And so um, that was definitely an avenue. And I, d I have made documentary films um, before. But um, there's always been sort of like this thing where I feel like, there's like a number one rule, you can't write about um, things that people do not directly tell you. And I think that, um, I always felt like when I would talk, interview people and get their stories, there's always something else I'm observing that's going on feeling wise and um, that, you know, you can't take the liberty in documentary. Although now, you know, documentaries are getting more and more experimental and um, there's some like ethical questions about that, but sort of, um, you know, thinking about some, some things that are so essential you cannot actually see or report from an observation, or there's, there's another level of observation, but I think it's um, a little bit more complicated, and you, I think to be careful, you have to assign like authorship over it, which is, you know, weird or whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of the process of sharing it, the reason why um, I did was because I just didn't see um, enough like representation of trauma post like you know outside of a courtroom or like outside of you know a dark alleyway on these like tropish ways of talking about sexual abuse um, and I know there's a lot out there you know in the independent that's not what I'm saying like oh I'm the first one no um, but it's sort of I think the more voices we have and the, the, the varying takes that they have on it, I think the more we understand that it's, oh, like, I feel that way too. And I think if it resonates for other people, um, that is sort of what the sharing is about. But there's also a level of agency in narr like creating a narrative. And, you know, um, I come from a family that doesn't know much about, like, I don't have a picture of my grandmother. Um, I don't know a lot about my father's side, because, you know, slavery. And so there's a lot of like um, myth making I have to create or like even thinking about um, ancestral trauma and ancestral joy that I think me creating um, allows me to communicate with my ancestors. So, yeah. I thought I might say something to the, the first question um, in that, uh, you know, as we see we have um, in sort of the art world, there'll be, <clears throat> uh, black artists will be severely underrepresented. And so, um, but I think it's not a question of being allowed to or not allowed to, but it's about a, a question of acknowledging white privilege and that there are plenty of conversations to be had um, about, that aren't centered on the suffering black body, but that are about looking back um, at the self, you know, so the white artist can look at the self, can look at white supremacy, can look at the history of white privilege. Do you know what I'm saying? So that way you're dealing with race, but you're not focusing on the on object of study. So that would be sort of, part of partially part of a response to that. 
And also this idea of fairness really refuses acknowledgement of like what has happened before. And I think um, in order to care or restore or even like think about these things, you have to acknowledge the past. So having a man up here would not, it's like, it's just kind of a moot thing. So yes, I believe we're um, out of time. Are we out of time yet? Yeah, we are unfortunately out of time, but we are not out of opportunities to pick up these conversations, including one concerning the Earl Sweatshirt collaboration, which I believe is on Vimeo as well. Yeah, you can watch it on YouTube. Yes, on YouTube. Um, but uh, no, we cannot ask a question, sorry. Uh, you can, however, stay and mingle over the lunch break, and there will be a round table at the end of the day. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking both of our presenters for a difficult and wonderful conversation. <laughs>